Good morning, homeschool friends. I have something to talk about, and it's really on my mind, but in one sense, like, who do I think I am <laughs> to say, um, to bring up what I'm going to bring up today. Um, in Classical Conversations, I'm looking forward to uh, next year, my family will be starting um, Challenge A, and we'll be switching over from IEW as a writing program into the Lost Tools of Writing. And I'm very excited about that. And I think the co-author of that is Andrew Kern. And I've been listening to um, podcasts and seminars and things. And I'm very excited. You know, in Essentials, we all laughed. <laughs> you know, we became uh, Andrew Pudua junkies because we listened to his uh, his videos and, and webinars and things. Um, just to glean wisdom and information on our homeschool journey, right? And it's wonderful, but I am kind of a... I think I'm a writing program snob and I'm like, well, my writing program guy is going to be better than your writing program guy because I really enjoy listening to Andrew Kern. Okay, all that as an introduction. <sighs> so, you all know I love Saxon math books, right? And I was very surprised right in the middle of an Andrew Kern video podcast to hear him say, and I think the word used was dumb. <laughs> John Sachs, Saxon math is dumb. <laughs> like, well, okay, here's an issue and how am I going to reconcile this in my brain? And who am I, uh, a homeschool mom, to go up against Andrew Poodle? Uh, Andrew, I got the wrong one. Andrew Kern, you know, um, uh, founder of the Searcy Institute. All kinds of, of great things uh, that he's done and is doing, um, but I have. Uh, I disagree on the Saxon math books, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I think uh, first it was the way he expressed it. It was the sentence he said. I was he said get raise raise math raise arithmetic, and I have that, and I think it's awesome too. I don't use it. It's very time intensive for me as a mom schooling all my kids, but. Um, so I'm not arguing that raise arithmetic is not good. I think it is because, I mean, you know, I went and hunt, hunted down the original versions or the best version, whatever, you know, like I do. Um, the one that I want to use. Okay, but he said, you know, when he took this raise arithmetic and he sat down with his four-year-old child to teach him math, he said, him math, her math, I don't know um, which child it was. But anyway, he said, after just like that one lesson in raise arithmetic, he understood more. He, as in the parent, understood more than he had. More than he had ever or more than whatever. To some great level, he had more understanding than he had before just after doing one lesson with a four-year-old. Okay, and so I don't understand because Andrew Curtin knows more about classical education than I do I've only been doing it for six, seven years, and um, when they're four, when the children are four, I personally don't really care about the understanding. There's a set of basic things I want you to know, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Especially when you're four, we're going to be memorizing a lot of things. And when it comes to math, I want them to memorize their math facts. and. Um, I do want to start them out with something, uh, um, yeah, I want you to know how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and there's some basic fundamental math operations that I want you to know how to do, and I've found these Saxon math books teach it um, very clearly, um, especially the old ones, not the new ones. I didn't have fun with those at all, but if you go back to the original ones, the first edition, and that's usually, see these letters, M, E, H, all these big letters, they're solid. That generally means first edition. Um, and I found, well, when I ordered the first edition Saxon 5-4, my oldest did that book when he was, I started him on it at age six and a half, and he did a lesson a day, pretty much six days a week until he finished the book. Um, so these old books, they're very clear and to the point and I did a video a long time ago comparing the first and third editions of Saxon Math 
and the books are like for example the first edition will take a half a page and go here's the new thing we're learning here it is and practice it and the current edition books will take two pages to explain the same thing and then say go practice it um, and there are there are more differences that I did not cover on that video but anyway I'm like well for my kid they're young and I just want it to be this is not English I'm teaching one thing at a time right now okay right now I want you to learn how to do these math things so how simply can I explain it to you or have it explained to you and you learn to do it um, so and that's one difference I did not understand why when he's teaching the rays well I do understand when he's teaching the rays to a four-year-old he the teacher the parent is going to understand more yes well, the brains that you and I are working with are not the brains of a four-year-old. And after we've lived our lives to this point, I mean, look at what all we've, we've got up here, right? This could really put some things together for us, and we will have an understanding. But I don't think that's what I'm going for in my child. Not to say that this wouldn't be great for them, and this will also teach them the basic fundamental things they need to know. Um, but classically... That didn't make sense and, and just the Saxon math books they're, they've been a big part of my life the past few years and my kids have learned a lot of math um, so secondly the thing that uh, Andrew Kern might um, be talking about and why he doesn't like them he might be talking about the current you know third and fourth edition books and not these old ones because or maybe he just isn't like learning basic fundamental math steps I don't I don't think that's right um, like Andrew Kern is going to watch my video and, and rebuttal. <laughs> that would probably, be, uh, probably humiliate me. But anyway, uh, so maybe he's looking at the current model textbooks. And the third thing is maybe, um, you know, I went the Robinson curriculum math route. Like start the kids on the Saxon 5-4 at age 7. And actually, I, I pulled that ahead a little bit because my kid needed something else to do more than I was giving him. So we started at six and a half. But anyway, uh, they're on the younger side than normally, you know, waiting around to fifth grade and then start start these books. So when my kid was six and a half, he needed something short and to the point. And Saxon math is not spiral. There's another, another word for it, maybe cumulative, um, but it's not spiral where you have to learn this before you move on. It is a, a cumulative, it's um, a constant review, incremental development and continuous review. Um, incremental meaning you learn something new today and then you're going to practice that, like your basketball, you can practice dribbling, practice your skills, right? And then, kind of like go play a game, here's 30 problems. Um, Oh, you go play a game of basketball, not play a game with your math. Although, if you can make math a game, your kids will love it <laughs> even more. Okay, um, so here's your, your practice set. Go practice this new thing that you just learned. Okay, now go do these 30 problems. The 30 problems, it's not spiral where you have to learn this thing before you can continue. It is cumulative. This is, this problem set is supposed to represent everything that you've learned in this book so far so that you don't forget the thing you learned yesterday and last week and all those things. It's just to, to keep, keep it in your fresh, in your mind, every day and over a long period of time it will be um, a little more ingrained, right? Because you've done this type of problem every day for 140 days now or however many lessons are in your book. And while I'm on that point, the newer editions, when I was comparing those to the old ones, the problem sets are different. Whereas in this edition, he might allocate five problems to this type problem, and the new ones did not. And they would take some of those and make those, uh, they would allocate some of those problems out of your 30 problem problem set, approximately, and they would allocate that to like a critical thinking problem, which is um, higher abstract, you know, where your child does need to be older and be able to reason through things uh, and figure it out. And my problem with that is when my kids are six and seven and eight and nine, I'm not going for that. I'm teaching at this point. I'm teaching basic math skills. Um, and 
how to do these things. And then when they get older and their brains mature a little bit, then the reasoning, you know, in classical education, we call that the dialectic um, or the logic stage when they start to take all this information that's in their head and, and relate it to each other and compare it and, and, and reason through it. And um, I didn't want that in a math book with my, with my young children because you throw those understanding problems on the young children and they physically, their brains physically can't focus on that. I really, they can't work on that and they can't give you the answer that you want. And then, so you count it wrong and then that's just demoralizing. <laughs> and then they think they can't do it and they, they see the stress of it. I'll have to pay, face another problem like that tomorrow. And just, oh, does it ever end? And um, that is, that is along the lines of Common Core. So, have I made any sense? Uh, normal homeschool mom going up against Andrew Kern. Yeah, whatever. Um, just had a, a problem with that. Raise arithmetic, probably really good. And, you know, my friends and I have talked about it. And if I had the time to sit with every kid and go over this, you know, maybe I would. But in my homeschool, I have been doing this stuff and it's working great. My 11 year old is in algebra one half and um, he's doing fine and he's at the kitchen table right now doing it and they're getting a little rowdy. So it's a good time for me to wrap this up and, uh, and get back to work. But thank you for listening. Thank you for letting me get that off my mind. I really don't like to talk too much and um, cause someone else to sit and watch their phone. Oh, while I brought that up, Moms, <laughs> I personally in my homeschool, I don't pass out the electronics to my kids. I mean, it's all I can do to keep me off the phone and my husband off the phone. Like, can we talk to each other, real life people here, instead of looking at our phone all the time? But if you are going to give your kid a phone, especially the babies, and, you know, let them play with the little things, apps and stuff on the iPad, put it in airplane mode, okay? Because even I don't have, I've not invested the money to, uh, to, buy, to buy the meter that would measure all the radiation and the type of radiation that's coming from that phone into the uh, area around their brain. So just put it in airplane mode. That'll be a lot safer. And that is all I can think of for now. Thank you very much for listening.